Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this I3H webinar. Uh, today, we are really extremely honored and pleased to welcome uh, Luc de Brun. I'm sure that many of you know Luc from the time he was the president of Global Vaccines at uh, GSK. And uh, actually, he was in this position until quite recently, but since two years, he moved to another very important strategic position as strategic advisor to the CEO of the so-called CP organization. And I, I, you, as you know, we are talking a lot about COVAX those days, but you will hear certainly more about COVAX from Luc. But Luc is uh, the uh, strategic advisor to the CEO of another extremely important global organization, which is called CEPI for Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And I'm sure that innovation will indeed be uh, at the center of his talk. So uh, Luc, I will not say so much about your really impressive career, except one thing, by reviewing your CV or bio sketch, I realized that you spent 25 years of your life in the same pharmaceutical company, GSK. And really it's unbelievable how you succeed to go from one step to the other. I think this should be rather unique in the pharmaceutical world where you know people are used to move from one company to the other. And I think that this tells us a lot about you know what drives you in, in, in life and in your professional life. So I would just like to thank you again for being with us this morning. And without further ado, I give you the floor for your presentation on global challenges of access to vaccines. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Michel. And uh, thank you very much for this kind, too kind introduction. Uh, 27 years with the same company, uh, it was uh, because I got uh, each time new challenges. So that's why you stay. There's no need to change actually because the change came by itself. Uh, but also because it was a, a GSK, a responsible company. That's where I got in touch with the global health aspect of, for instance, vaccinations. Um, I, I feel really humbled to be invited here uh, to speak to this audience. Uh, we normally should get used to, to Zoom, but I'm not actually to give uh, presentations and all of that. So let's, let's see how this goes. Um, since the beginning of this pandemic, actually, uh, we did not only have to deal with a virus that we knew a little bit, but where we learned a lot about in 2020, but at the same time, we are dealing with an infodemic. Um, you know, Nature recently said that there are over 24,000 articles published uh, in six months, and another source basically says that uh, we have already over 60,000 articles talking about from left to right, all the aspects of this pandemic, of the virus, of the vaccines and so on. So what the, I will try to do and cover in the next 45 minutes or so is rather than reviewing literature and all of that, is sharing my experience. My experience of working from the very beginning with SEPI uh, through this COVAX period and also looking forward, working on the strategy for the next five years. And that's the way I've organized a bit my presentation. So um, CEPI was created in 2017, uh, but my first experience is actually from a little bit before. So I will start from there. Um, I would say maybe uh, at the end of my presentation, but I'll say it at the beginning for those who are interested to read an interesting book, because that actually summarizes my, what I would say, what I've experienced so far during this pandemic is this book from uh, Frank Snowden, a Yale historian, about the impact actually of infectious diseases on society. Because I think I've never experienced before, not in my 27 years career, this amazing um, impact of this pandemic on society, again, in all its aspects. And I hope I will be able to share some of that experience uh, on that. So it's, it's a good, uh, uh, advice to read or to read that book. It was published last year. It's about, uh, you know, the fact that epidemics in history have had as much impact for uh, many leaders um, on how society behaves, 
changes and adapts uh, to it. Not only economic crises do that, or wars and revolutions, but also uh, infectious diseases. So my first experience, um, try to figure back or play back to February 2016. This was five months before the WHO declared uh, Guinea transmission free of Ebola. And I went down there to Conakry with Brussels Airlines. And one important uh, information, this was the only airline that still wanted to fly to Guinea because of the Ebola threat. So I landed there and why did I go there? Well, I wanted to experience basically the journey of the GSK Ebola vaccine that was also being flown in at that moment for trials in Guinea. And it was an amazing experience. When I came on the ground, I was brought to this tented hospital camp um, where we were uh, measured our temperature. Uh, we were sprayed uh, to be uh, disinfected. We had to put on boots and then step with our boots into a bucket. All of that was very well prepared. And then we experienced the heat of the gowning and being in those tents at 30, 40 degrees centigrade. And you know what? Uh, quite quickly, I found myself in another book, basically, of Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, where on the one hand, I was really impressed how international community had come together, has put international aid, had flown in uh, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and other organizations, had provided money. And I was obviously proud as a GSK president in those days that we were flying in our, our vaccine. And, you know, Merck was also taking a responsible action and, um, and uh, Johnson & Johnson as well, you know, to work on, on, on that Ebola vaccine. But A Tale of Two Cities, so impressed about that collaborative massive effort at that point uh, in time, but at the same time, the reality came to my eyes as well. So when we then visited uh, uh, villages and when I spoke with Ebola survivors and when I visited their infrastructure, I was really um, horrified actually, because they were sent fridges or refrigerators for their vaccines from Japan, from China. But you know what? They had power cuts all the time. So I, I said to the people, I wouldn't put my Belgian beer in that fridge actually, because I'm not sure if it will stay cold. They put their vaccines. We had to put our vaccines. Secondly, refrigerators were breaking down, but they didn't have any technicians who were capable of making those or mending those refrigerators. So many were left there, not, not operating. And the thing that struck me most was initially, I was impressed that Ebola survivors actually uh, helped in those Ebola centers. But you know what the real truth was? They couldn't go back to their cities, to their villages, to their communities. Why? Because they were considered as lepra or, you know, we don't want to have to deal with them. It's an evil disease. So pretty clear there that community engagement wasn't taken care of at that moment. And if you read an article that Renal Rapoli uh, published in The Lancet pretty quickly actually after uh, this West Africa outbreak is that as quickly as it was declared Ebola free or transmission free, as quickly the money disappeared. And so I can also share you my industry experience, which is yes, companies stepped up to the game but we are left with a bitter taste. First of all, you postpone um, research projects that have to move away because you only have that many top scientists that work on that Adeno platform. So we had to delay research programs at GSK. The impact of the supply chain was felt even two years later because as you know, the lead time to make a vaccine, well, that has changed since RNA vaccines, but the lead time is, is between one and two years. So it had an impact on the supply chain. And you know what? And you can talk to Merck for five years. During five years, they had to invest in post-approval studies to get the vaccine finally licensed. So all of that to say that that first experience was an experience of reactive mode is absolutely not good enough. We need to get into a proactive modus of preparing for uh, dealing or preventing epidemics. And that's basically where this global collective uh, effort was done 
uh, in 2017 at Davos, of which you see the picture here, where uh, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, was created with, you know, uh, Norway was a big push, India, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and the World Economic Forum who facilitated. And as you can see on this picture, you know, the CEOs of the big companies were there and, and those funders were there. So this was a, a, an amazing effort. And already then, just think about, about the timing, this is 1617, it was said that we absolutely need a global governance with very strong leadership to make sure that these things like in West Africa don't happen again. Just think about that for a second, I would say. Now, CEPI was launched there at, at Davos and uh, it was because we need safe and efficacious vaccines. So one of the missions is accelerated vaccine development. And the second piece is make sure that those are accessible to those who need those vaccines. But one big difference with what we are experiencing today is that CEPI was created to prevent actually epidemics to become a pandemic. And we used the, the WHO blueprint list of pathogens that are uh, a threat actually to humanity to start working on Lassa fever, on, um, on uh, Nipah, on uh, Rift Valley fever, on uh, actually MERS, um, and also finishing the job actually on the Ebola vaccine. So that was the initial remit and we were able to gather some, and again, just think about the numbers, $700 million to spend over a period of five years to accelerate that vaccine development and focusing on phase one, phase two of that development. And I was there uh, at the beginning uh, as an interim board member because the board of CEPI was then called an interim board as it was created. And I can tell you it was, it was tough. Why? Because you had industry sitting at the table you had obviously these uh, philanthropic organizations sitting at the table, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, and you had some civil society organizations sitting there. I still remember vividly, she was mostly sitting next to me, Joanne Lee from uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. And some policies were decided on IP, and we can spend a day on IP. Uh, I'll, I'll touch upon it later. But uh, policies on IP and on access commitments for those companies. Those were all put into those uh, uh, policies for CEPI. And it proved that it was very difficult and we had to adopt them to be able to get the right partners uh, at the table. Investment is also done on enabling signs, something that I don't know if the word existed before, but enabling signs is basically regulatory sciences, manufacturing sciences, making sure that we have centralized laboratories that uh, the animal facilities are used in a correct way. So enabling science and primarily focusing on regulatory because that's an important one. And then there's one piece of research that we focused on disease X, meaning the unknown pathogen and trying to prepare for that by working on technology platforms. But just think about back about the 700 million. If you know that uh, I can share that number because it's published that a company like G GSK spends every year four billion on R&D and other companies even more. So just to give you a bit of a, a ballpark number. Now, my provocative read of my experience with the creation of SEPI and the funding that came is that primarily, let's, let's, uh, I forgot to say this, it was ODA funding. So this is basically development money international development money and philanthropy. So it, it was created out of solidarity. But my provocative read out of it is it's high income countries that want to make them sure that infectious diseases of the developing world do not hit their territory or their continent and are kept out. And therefore they give the money, SEPI, you just deal with it and make sure that this uh, stays out of our country so that it doesn't um, create economic uh, havoc or, or anything else. I know this is a black and white statement maybe, but it's my observation. Uh, the good news is that my next experience was um, a bit later actually, after that CEPI was created was Ebola in DRC, outbreak in DRC. And there we co could already reap actually, or harvest the fruits of the work that CEPI had done uh, in, the, in the two years before that because vaccines were very quickly made available. 
community engagement was happening. We learned still a lot. I, I, I gave a talk, I, I remember two years ago, where I uh, spoke to scientists to talk about and challenge them on their role in these kind of epidemics in the developing world, where we need to think about a new way of international development and transferring capabilities and, and, and capacities rather than, uh, for instance, saying, send me the blood samples, I'll analyze them in London or I'll analyze them in New York or Boston. They refused that actually. We had to look with, uh, work with the local uh, people there, uh, create capacity on the ground, which is great and uh, absolutely new international development. So CEPI has made sure that in its mission as well, low middle income countries, capacity and capability transfer is part of the mission to provide access not only for today, but also for the future. And, and we'll come back to that. But so bottom line, I think there we saw a first sign of science and innovations coming together with society and solving a problem very quickly. And it is also the first time that Gavi, which is another organization that I will comment on, but Gavi is the Global Alliance for Vaccines uh, and Immunizations that was created to make sure that low and middle income countries can get vaccines, routine vaccinations uh, for the children primarily. Um, even if they can't afford it, they get those vaccines through big uh, contracts with, uh, with uh, the vaccine making companies and producing companies. But Gavi stockpiles now uh, Ebola vaccine. That means when there is the next outbreak, we can uh, uh, very quickly react. If I can have the next slide. My next experience, actually my third experience um, is basically the, what we experienced now. And it was January, 2020, when I received a phone call from a Boston-based, I need to see that I say it correctly, a Boston-based citizen of Wuhan, an investor, who kind of, let me say, desperately rang me because he got my name through the Chinese authorities. And he was quite desperate saying, hey, what can CEPI do? Because this is, this is crazy what's happening here. Uh, can, can you help us? And how can I facilitate, you know, through my contacts and blah, blah, when we started talking? The good news was also that at that very moment, Davos 2020 was happening and people uh, like Jeremy Farrar, Jeremy Farrar is the CEO of the Wellcome Trust, Richard Hatchett is the CEO of uh, CEPI of the coalition and Peter Piot uh, from the London School, they were found, finding themselves together with the Gates Foundation and so on with Bill Gates at Davos and could instantly quickly react and interact because everybody you need actually without flying around you could mobilize there to make sure that uh, there was an initial response. And people tend to forget that because of the fact that CEPI was there on the 23rd um, you know, of, of uh, January, um, we were already in touch with Moderna and planning an investment for phase one clinical trial material. So that actually 60 days after the communication of the sequence uh, of the virus, they were already producing clinical trial materials and going into the clinic uh, with a phase one. In February, uh, on February 27th, we made a decision on investing in manufacturing at risk because nobody would know which vaccine would, would, would work. And in March, we produced a first paper with CEPI on fair allocation. This is before Act A or COVAX, which I will talk about, was created. And the contracts that we were signing or CEPI was signing with the companies were contracts with a first right of refusal, meaning that we uh, reserved doses for CEPI so that we could ship those doses once they would be working, approved and all of that, ship them to those who need them the most. That's, that was the intent of that contracting, that very early contracting. I must say, I was really impressed, and I think the world is impressed by this huge collaborative scientific effort that was happening at the very beginning. Whatever they can say, I mean, COVAX or CEPI, um, US, our friend Trump did not uh, participate in all of that and created uh, Operation Warp Speed, but I can tell you and share that on a scientific level, that collaborative effort was absolutely there across the globe. So. At first, very impressed because nobody could have thought that we would have a vaccine, um, you know, that has passed phase three and is available for uh, approval.
before the end of 20, in one year time, in less than one year time. Of course, this is based upon many years of basic research that still needs to continue and happen. So with this incredible sense of urgency, then on the 4th of May, there was the creation of Act A, which is you know, ac uh, creating access to therapies diagnost or diagnostics, therapies and vaccines for the whole world basically, coming together in the biggest uh, multilateral uh, effort ever since the Paris Climate Agreement, where uh, hundreds of countries signed up for uh, this uh, Act A uh, organization, multilateral organization. But you know, this was again too late in the sense that it was made on the fly, or as Seth Barkley, the, the CEO of Agave, would say, is building a ship in the midst of a storm. So there were no pre-agreements or there was no such a thing as a global agreement on how this would be taken forward. So COVAX was created as part of that and COVAX is basically the vaccine spiller to make sure that a diverse portfolio of uh, COVID-19 vaccines is being developed and managed actively, meaning in uh, bringing products in or vaccines in the portfolio, but also moving out if they don't deliver on the milestones and making sure that funding happens at risk to get that development going. And also making sure that then there is procurement of those vaccines with the companies to ensure that also developing countries, but also self-financing countries can have access to all of that. It's an end-to-end -end solution with CEPI, Gavi, which basically does the procurement and uh, runs the facility to make sure that there is distribution of those vaccines with UNICEF uh, and so on. And you have the WHO as a policy setting organization. What did we see? That is that actually, initially, this was intended to run for the whole globe. High income countries, middle income countries, and low uh, income countries and the middle income countries. But that has proven to be difficult. And I'll, uh, I'll comment uh, about that in, in a second. If I may have the next slide, please. Here you see the portfolio and I'll leave it a bit on the back. Uh, I don't think you need to, uh, we need to go through that because that's in all those publications that are uh, all out there. But I'd rather share, uh, my uh, further experience with COVAX uh, during this COVID-19. But this is the active portfolio that we are uh, managing at CEPI and it's active portfolio management. And there's also matchmaking efforts, meaning putting, for instance, uh, AstraZeneca together with Oxford or CureVac is working with Bayer to get the necessary support or moving AstraZeneca vaccine into Serum Institute of India to be produced. But I'll come and comment on that. On, on the pluses and the minus in, in a second. But before I do that, I want to make an important disclaimer. Um, it's very easy sitting in an armchair to point towards everything that goes wrong or that could be better or criticized in this kind of a pandemic crisis. Um, I'm by nature an optimist, but I'm also a realist. And I don't think there's a contradiction between being an optimist, but facing reality with a constructive modus to make sure that we can do better. So that's the spirit of how I will comment actually on uh, or share my experience uh, with COVAX. The first observation that I had is that as long as there is uncertainty, the drive for collaborative and multilateral effort is very high. The propensity is very high because nobody knew at the beginning of 2020 how to deal with this pandemic, how this virus would behave. Will we have a vaccine? Which technology to invest in? And I think that was the good news of this multilateral effort that everybody came together actually to share that fear and invest in it and then try to manage or have an organization like COVAX or ACT A work on diagnostics uh, therapeutics and COVAX on vaccines to at least have a portfolio of vaccines with you know, dose regulation and all of that, all with the intent of speed, scale, and access. 
That was the intent. So speed to get as fast as possible to a vaccine or to different vaccines. Scale to have billions necessary. You know that the world was only used to make four or five billion doses a year. Now the calculations say we need 14, one, four billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine only whilst making all those other routine vaccinations that we still need. And the access to make sure that everybody could have it because the conviction was and is that, you know, uh, an infection anywhere is a threat everywhere. At least that was the start. But then again, we were not prepared globally. There were no pre-agreements um, on access and all of that. So again, on the fly had to be created. And then it's clear that as much as uncertainty leads to collaborative efforts, as much that scarcity becomes the enemy of equity. So meaning that, you know, suddenly when a bit before the end of 2020, one started to see that actually, wow, we will have five, six vaccines that work and that can be ready for filing and that show good efficacy and safety during clinical trials. Then suddenly you see a different reflex, a regional reflex a national reflex. And that is exactly the challenge that we see with COVAX. If I can have the next slide, please. You see um, this on this slide is the intent that um, was formulated at the beginning of the creation of COVAX, which was to have CEPI, Gavi and WHO co-leading COVAX to make sure that we can end the acute phase of the pandemic before the end of 2021 by producing, delivering, procuring 2 billion doses before that end of 2021. Why? Because this is to cover, or what you need to cover 20% of um, basically all those partners in COVAX for at-risk people and healthcare workers. That was the initial target that was put forward. And again, we can question if that is still the right target, yes or no, because very quickly <clears throat> it became clear that there was a massive tension between two things. One, I am a minister of health in Belgium, France, whatever, wherever, I need to look after my population versus, but we know this is a global crisis. I need to make sure that also the globe has access to those vaccines. So a very strong tension between those two things and just put yourself in the shoes of a politician, not very easy to deal with that. Definitely when there are no pre-agreements, when there is scarcity, when there is not enough capacity and all of that, all the compounding factors. And then the second piece, tension, is the tension between wanting to get to herd immunity as quick as possible to get our lives back, meaning targeting 70% at least of vaccination versus a 20% target, as I just was explaining, to make sure you cover at-risk uh, people so that you can prevent hospitalizations, uh, intensive care and death, and then um, uh, essential healthcare workers so that they can do their job. An amazing tension. Just add on top of that, it's compounded with the variants because, because of the variants, what you see now is even those countries who did bilateral deals are hoarding those vaccines that they had too many actually. And it was normal that they, we recommended to buy too many because nobody knew in the middle of 2020, which vaccine would work. But now with the variants, everybody's thinking about boosting and what you name it. We don't know yet scientifically, but let's not dwell on that. And add to that the geopolitical uh, dimension of the Chinas, the, the Russia, uh, Russia's, the US, the Europe of this, of this world, you know, with all uh, DPA, uh, Defense Production Act in the US, preventing that essential materials leave the country, uh, export controls in Europe, you know, all creating tensions that do not help to this COVAX initiative. So, if I can have the next slide, you will see here uh, on the next slide why COVAX matters, but I prefer not to dive into the slide itself because it's self-explanatory, I would almost say. 
But it's here where I want to share my COVAX experience, both the positive and the negative experience. And the first experience, because this should teach us how we need to go forward. Um, and and I'll, um, I'll comment on that in a second. Is that first of all, my experience is you cannot raise money during a pandemic. It is crazy that still today, Act A is lacking billions to do the necessary work to achieve what Act A was set up for, meaning equitable, fair access to diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines for the world. Today, still gaps of billions, which are compared to, first of all, the investment case for those <laughs> who study econo economics. I mean, the investment case is very clear. Uh, every day, every week, you can cut off of this pandemic. The, the economic benefits are massive. I don't need to explain that. Secondly, if you look at the recovery packages of trillions that have been decided, rightly so, to, to inject, to recover and all of that, then what Act A or COVAX needs is only a fraction. So I am very personally very frustrated that leaders have been shouting everywhere, uh, you know, what needs to happen. But actually when push comes to show are very, very, um, uh, looking into the on the money and not really prepared to step up. Hopefully that changes. Important conferences are happening as we speak uh, over the next days or so. But so you can't raise money during a pandemic is the first experience I had. And secondly, that ODA money, international development money, is not good enough. It should be a whole of government approach where economies decide together, world leaders decide together to put the necessary money in an insurance perspective. A great achievement of COVAX is liability and indemnification. For those who don't know, uh, liability and indemnification during a pandemic is based on the fact that because you get an emergency use license, meaning not a full regulatory approval license in some areas to apply very quickly, use those vaccines very quickly, you cannot expect that companies can fully bear the risk if side effects happen or if something goes wrong. Of course, the whole GMP, meaning good manufacturing practice, making the vaccine to the levels of quality standards that are needed is the and stays, remains the responsibility of, uh, the, um, of the company. But anything that goes wrong with side effects, a liability and indemnification clause means that the governments take over that responsibility. And it's a great achievement that actually COVAX has for all the AMC countries, that means all the poor countries has a, with the international development banks achieved this indemnification and a liability clause. But there's still a lot of work to do. So let's try to build upon that because for instance, in Europe, every single country needs to decide that there's no such a thing as a European legislation that covers that. And so that means that companies need to deal with every country on its own once they procure uh, vaccines. But I think this is a win and a platform to build uh, from, because that's important also from an access perspective, because otherwise countries would be held back. I'm sorry if there's background noise, but I'm sure everybody during Zoom meetings has had this. Um, this was an unforeseen work they're doing here in, a, in an apartment that is not mine. So uh, sorry if, uh, if there is too much background noise. The third thing is, uh, which is very important, is everything that has to do with tech transfers. Um, what the world needs is a clear strategy on tech transfers. And this is way bigger than just having a discussion on an IP waiver. It's very important, and I, I have pretty strong views on that. We can discuss uh, during discussion time on, on IP if you want, or IP waiving. But it's not about IP. It's about making sure that those who own and created the technology can transfer that knowledge and that technology in a, I would call it a dialogue with those companies to regions so that we have a, a better regional spread of capacity. I mean, just for your information, all the capacity is in Europe primarily and in the US. And there was recently held a African Union summit on manufacturing where it's very clear they have less than 1% on their continent of production. And if it's production, you know, we have Senegal, we have South Africa, and it's still finished mostly. The only vaccine they really make is yellow fever. 
at the uh, Institute, the Pasteur Institute in Dakar, Senegal. This is not normal. Why? Because <clears throat> they use 24% of the world's vaccines and have only 1% or less than 1% capacity. So tech transfer absolutely need to be way more globally distributed to prepare for future pandemics, but also to deal with routine vaccination. But just waving an IP will not be good enough. It's absolutely important that fundamental discussions happen with the developers of those vaccines and the manufacturers with the people who will. Because if you look at today's problems of COVAX deliveries, every country has experienced those. So far, it's only Pfizer that really with BioNTech is a reliable supplier of its vaccine. All the others struggle. You know why? Because it's based upon tech transfers, many tech transfers to different CMOs, contract manufacturing organizations across the world. And the faster you do a tech transfer, the more challenge you have on the process robustness. Companies like Merck, GSK, Sanofi, and so on, they invest every year millions in the process robustness of the manufacturing process so that they can, can continuously improve that process to get to a reliable supply of vaccines. That is the biggest thing that we have seen now as a challenge, even if we can be very impressed about the millions of billions of doses that are being produced, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, you name them, they all have serious manufacturing issues going forward as well, because one, they don't have safety stocks to rely on when there is a, a hiccup in the manufacturing supply or in the supply chain. So every bump in the road, you feel instantly in the distribution. And that is because, again, no pre-agreements on tech transfers, again, being done on the fly whilst we're in the middle of a crisis. And therefore you have this, but let's be happy of where we are because it could have been way uh, worse. The scale up, um, I already mentioned the scale up, uh, the geopolitics obviously cross through that. So the scale up meaning getting to billions of doses to get to that magic number of 12 to 14 billion doses that we need if we want to cover the whole population of the world and make sure that we end this uh, pandemic, still questioning what potentially the variants uh, will do or if it becomes a commodity like flu where you need to be uh, revaccinated, we don't know yet. We don't have enough data yet uh, for that. But clearly on scale up, my key message here is, because that's a bit a movement that you see at this very moment, is that national capacity building is not the solution. It is impossible to have manufacturing facilities in every single country. That's why we need to applaud initiatives like HERA that Ursula von der Leyen has announced. And as we see, which is kind of um, copied uh, from what the US is doing uh, with BARDA since many years in 2016, which is having local capacity, meaning regional capacity, but not in every single country. It needs to be a network. But the big question mark is, how do you wire this as a global manufacturing network? Because it's clear that the supply chains will remain uh, global. You cannot uh, ensure that everything is local and it would not be good for, for, for anybody actually to, to try to have that. But regional effort is absolutely what needs to happen. And CEPI, as, as I will explain later, plays a very important role in, um, I would say, wiring that network on a, on a global phase. It's great to see that <clears throat> CEPI has signed a memorandum of understanding uh, with uh, the African Union to facilitate capacity building in Africa. And I'm very involved with that as I'm part of the African Working Group to make this happen. But again, it's not only IP that will say, uh, solve this, it's absolutely dialogue <clears throat> with the developers, with the manufacturers, and make sure we can start building that capacity with local ownership, because that's something I've learned massively through this pandemic as well. Developing countries don't want to be treated uh, or with, a, with an attitude of colonization or anything like that. Sorry for the strong word, but they want to be, they want to own it. They want to participate with, with capacity, with capability and prepare better for the future themselves. And we should be helping. So I really applauded what I read this morning in the FT, in the Financial Times that Europe 
is also absolutely stepping up to that in new international development of helping African Union to create uh, capacity in Africa. So that's great to see those moves. Let's see how they get uh, in, in, into action, of course. The thing where I've been most impressed with and who have blown away <clears throat> most of the, the developers and the manufacturers is regulatory. I think regulatory has really made a massive difference in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. They've accelerated everything. They've prioritized everything that had to do with COVID. They were there from the very beginning. <clears throat> Already now also for the variants, they have issued criteria uh, for how they would do technical bridges or immuno bridges, you name it, what criteria they want to use to approve vaccines, be it for emergency use or for licensing. And that has helped a lot to the speed that I was mentioning earlier, speed to get to those vaccines, speed to get them to vaccination, meaning in the arm, a jab in the arm of those who need it. What is very important here is that we need to work in the future to ensure that these regulators can continue to play their independent role, lose from politics, lose from anything. They should remain the trusted um, um, beacon or uh, lighthouse for quality, safety, and efficacy. And uh, here again, I think CEPI and COVAX has played a very important role in enabling that through what I called earlier enabling science, which is making sure that um, for instance, we, uh, CEPI has created centralized laboratory capacity so that we measure in the same way, that we use the same yardsticks if we compare A with B or with C. That we put available animal facilities to those smaller biotechs who can't afford that so that we can accelerate the development. That we work with regulators on harmonization to make sure that we have only barco one barcode across the globe. <clears throat> I can share you my experience, I will not, but in 2009, when there was pandemic flu, I was in the Netherlands, even the size of the boxes, they couldn't agree in Europe uh, of where we had to put the vaccines in. So regulators, an amazing, important role, and they really stepped up to the game. So let's start, let's continue to build on that. And if I mentioned Africa, they also want to create their African medicines agency, a pretty much tailored up on or, or looking towards European Medicines Agency, well, let's help them to build that capacity rather than having a competition in every single country in Africa to build its own stringent regulatory authority. There are more important matters to, to work on there as there are uh, pharmacovigilance and so on. Now, we have all this now to build on the future, but the one thing I haven't mentioned is access. How are we doing on access? Well, honestly, my opinion is we need to plan for this completely different. And where the intent on the 4th of May was absolutely there, I, I think I've explained already during my talk the factors that have compounded all of this. And my conviction is that during peacetime, we need to get to these pre-agreements so that we have more capacity, more geographical spread capacity available, and that we have policies that can actually lay out how we will distribute on a fairly basis though, because during the crisis, it's very difficult to make that happen. Will that be easy? Absolutely not. Can it be done? Absolutely yes. And I think we already made massive progress from where we came. I mean, just think about Europe. I mentioned 2009 pandemic flu, every country was fighting, closing its borders, you name it, at least there was a European effort. Was it perfect? Absolutely not. Can we do better? Yes, but at least we had uh, uh, important steps and the ambition is there going forward. So to move to the last part, uh, if I still have time, uh, Michel, um, I think we now need to build on all of that for the future. And the urgency is now because all governments actually have put health finally on top of the list, because if you look at the sustainable development goals, it's, it's number three of 17, actually health underpins everything. And I think governments now absolutely realize. And so let me share maybe on the next slide, if I may. CEPI's ambitious five-year plan that we have presented to the board and 
which is building upon actually all the reports and interactions that we had so far with all the parties that have looked into how we can that how we can do better and what can be CEPI's role in that. I think we can summarize the impact of the pandemic at four levels. One is the direct health impact, no need for explanation. The indirect health impact, because we had to postpone very necessary care for cancer patients or other people. The societal impact, where we clearly see that it has lifted the lid on inequality even more, inequalities even more, because of the reasons I, I, I said. And then the geopolitical impact, the forces north, south, uh, east, west. And the key question now for the future is how do you prevent those four of happening ag again? It's pretty much like antimicrobial resistance or climate. You know, that's the, the, the dimension that we need to look into this problem. Um, the good news is that we have seen unprecedented technological and scientific development and regulatory science development. Uh, and progress. And um, this leaves us now with the necessary capabilities and capacities to do, the, to do what really needs to be done. I mean, when I was at GSK, we were working on messenger RNA, but nobody would have believed that this trajectory can, was accelerated with 10 years, I would say. So let's, let's build up on that so that we can deal with the vulnerabilities of the future in a better way, an organized way. CEPI's ambition is to raise 3.5 billion different from the 700 million, to work on these three pillars of prepare, transform, and connect. But I mean, I can go in, in every detail of what prepare means. I think it speaks for itself. It's, it's making sure that we develop vaccines for known threats. But number two is even more important is to transform, is to produce prototype, work with prototype vaccines with technology platforms so that we constantly test and make sure that we have a systemic readiness that when they really happen, it will never be the virus that you studied, but then you can quickly make the trans transformation like we did actually for MERS. Uh, those companies like Oxford University were, were, who are working on MERS switched instantly to COVID-19. COVID and so we've laid out an ambition, which is really a moonshot, which you see a number four on this slide, is to work to compress vaccine development timelines to 100 days. You can say, where does 100 come from? Well, it's from, se from sequencing the virus to having a file ready to be filed and to be approved. And this is why you need the systemic readiness to be able to activate this through these technology platforms and by working on enabling sciences that can uh, make this happen. And then the last dimension connect I think is the most important, well, they're all important, otherwise we wouldn't have chosen these three. But the connect dimension is in this changed ecosystem that we see now. You see regions really stepping up with a, of course, with a focus on looking after their region, but that's good because that means they will put money forward, they will invest like with Hera, but also the ASEAN region, Singapore, African Union, they all want to invest now and the moment is really now. But we need to get diligently to a, I would say post COVID consensus or call it a pandemic treaty because the game, the ecosystem needs to be played at a national level, at a regional level and at a global level. And I always mention uh, Julio Frank, ex uh, minister of uh, health in Mexico and a Harvard professor who published uh, already a while ago on the paradox of sovereignty. We need to, we need to get over that and I think we are at the phase when nations or at least single countries do realize that you cannot do this on your own. Regions have a different reflex. They think you don't need the globe. That's a wrong reflex as well. So we need to get together. But I'm hopeful because this week we have the Global Health Summit, a very important uh, gathering, I would say, where uh, at least intent will be expressed on what they have learned and what they want to do. We have <clears throat> the G7, uh, with Boris Johnson, uh, of course, they all want to profile themselves. We have the G20 with the Italian leadership of Mario Draghi combined with the Global Health Summit, and they want to get to some kind of a Rome declaration. I think we should applaud all those initiatives. What the challenge will be is to bring it to a global governance that is accepted by those regions, because in the end, when a pandemic hits, it is global and you need strong political leadership at G7 and G20 uh, level. 
So if I can finish with my last slide then. CEPI absolutely needs to be the catalyzing factor in all of this because there's no such an organization. Nations can't do it. Uh, this is not the task of WHO. We need to make WHO stronger, but we need to let it do what it's good at and not try to make a authoritative uh, organization out of it. But um, CEPI wants to be a catalyzer to mobilize all of this <laughs> using the experience of everything we've done so far um, in, a, in an urgently needed global health uh, ecosystem where equitable fair uh, access is predetermined and pre-agreed with a clear role for local global, uh, uh, as I said. And I want to finish with the expression that I, I've used my whole career to stay probably 27 years at GSK as well, Michel, which is from Pasteur, from Louis Pasteur, which is chance favors the prepared mind. And, and that's really what, what, it, what it is about. And as I said, with the mentioning of the book of Frank Snowden, uh, the impact on societies, the only thing that can really solve it is political leadership. Um, you know, combined with, of course, fantastic science and innovation, but they need to find a way of collaborating even better than, than what they've done so far. And I'll, I'll stop here, Michel, uh, with my uh, flying over the CEPI history, and hopefully I gave some accents. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, like all those who attend this webinar, we have been really impressed and, and I must say that coming to your conclusions, we need this type of organizations, we need political leaderships, but we also need people who are able to understand the constraints and the interest of all the different stakeholders. And I think that during this webinar, you clearly illustrate that you have this multidimensional perspective based obviously on your career at GSK, but also of your interests for public health, major public health questions. So let me start with the first question, which I think is very much in the media those days, at least in Belgium, is about, you know, sharing vaccine doses. And at the same time, as you know, in the US, they are extremely active in trying to vaccinate as many children and adolescents as possible. And as you know, there is this debate, what should be the priority with available doses in our countries, either to protect our infants or to donate those doses for the most vulnerable people in low and in middle income countries. Well, I mean, I, I think I've shared this tension that exists between this 20% and this 70% of herd immunity. But I think we also realize more and more with the variants, actually, unfortunately, with the variants, we realize that if we don't control the globe, then actually it's not good enough to just control what you do in your own country or in your own region. And therefore, the propensity to review or revisit actually this, this drive to just protect your own country or your own region is changing as we speak. Is it good enough? No, it's not good enough because um, at this moment, um, the US doesn't release enough doses. They, they could release way more doses, you know, but they, they keep them. Why? Well, they keep them, they play some geopolitics with it, with Mexico, with, uh, with, with Canada, you know, with sharing of doses. But so far they haven't approved the file for AstraZeneca in the US, which is hampering actually the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine that they have that they don't need. Um, same thing, Novavax vaccine is made in Serum Institute of India. We all obviously know, and there's an ethical obligation to, to let the Indians use the vaccines, but the fact that the COVAX portfolio was pretty skewed towards this mass uh, production in both BioE for the J&J vaccine and the Novavax and, and uh, AstraZeneca in Serum Institute of India, they run out of uh, critical ingredients because of the, the Defense Production Act. Those are very important elements, and that was part of the FT article this morning, you know, to push the US to release that. Europe, some European countries, France has already decided to deliver doses. It's, um, it's only, again, that political leadership at G7, G20 that can solve this, because an individual politician, if you are Minister of Health, you can't solve this. You cannot answer that. But let us remind one piece. When we said to end the acute phase of the pandemic, the target was 
to make sure that we prevent hospitalizations, intensive care, unit admissions, and death. You don't need to vaccinate 70% for that or and all your children on top of that to achieve that, at least not in this phase of the pandemic. So there is a big push necessary now of this political leadership to make sure that this dose sharing really happens. What we tend to forget in the media is let's not blame countries that they bought too many vaccines. They didn't know which vaccine would work. This was our recommendation, just buy more than what you need. That's what COVAX did as well. We invested in, in 10 and more, and we are still investing in wave two vaccines because we need to continue to invest in innovation and, 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 and having vaccines that work. And we were lucky that we had uh, five before the end of the year. So I can't answer the question. It's really up to that, that, to that political leadership to, to make that happen now. And I think the pressure is on because they realize it's a global effort, absolutely. Thank you very much, Luc. You, you just mentioned to invest in a, into innovation. So we just have a, a question from Philippe Montaigne, and I know that you know Philippe very well. So he tells me, so you sh we should hear, Luc, about the issue of, of patents and patents waiver. And as you, as you know, and you know, the argument of industry is without patent, without protection of IP, I mean, there will be no innovation from the industry side. So well, I would like to have your comment on this and perhaps Philippe can, you know, continue the discussion after. I don't know if Anya or Caroline yeah, no, can I'm, actually... I'm, I'm amused at in the meantime. I just yeah, start I think by I... answering the overall question. Yeah, I, I think I'm unmuted in the meantime. So Luc, uh, very good job. It's not easy what you do to talk without seeing the audience. So, <laughs> but indeed, it might be great to, to hear your comment about the, the question of patents. Well, I, I think um, my, my conviction, I, I was on Radio 1 last week uh, discussing this because obviously it was a hot topic uh, everywhere. Um, I think the debate is a bigger debate. So meaning... Yes, you can, I mean, and they've been debating this, you know, the United Nations panel that was created where Andrew Whitty was part of as the only industry guy. You know, there's a big United Nations report that was published on, on patent waiving and compulsory licenses and all of that. But that's too narrow a discussion. I think the discussion needs to be pulled to a bigger level is how do you provide fair and equitable access? How do you ensure that there is geographical capacity spreading? And how do you then use and in dialogue with the industry, ensure that they continue to invest in innovations, because I am personally convinced that patents are basically the fuel of your innovation motor. Uh, because what, what's the point in investing in a thermostable vaccine if you will not be able to sell it, but somebody else will sell it for you? I mean, I, I, I don't see the point. However, let's not go black and white either. I'm not, <clears throat> I, I don't like to be the industry point of view to say, you know, absolutely not. No, it's let's sit at the table, let's talk and let's make agreements that during pandemics or, and I'll come back to a, a proposal that you know very well, Philippe, I, I think, which is the biopreparedness organization proposal that we did make at GSK, which is basically making collaborative public-private partnerships with the industry so that you, without having their license or you use the license for pandemic preparedness preparations, but you let them have the oversight so that you know the technology platform can be used and updated actually with their innovations so that you constantly are at, 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 at so public private is the solution, not mm. a, getting into a fighting modus because you know what, you will scare them away. Next time they will not answer the phone and you will be left over with all respect with small biotech which, which create and university which create fantastic innovations. But to turn an innovation into a product, you need a, you need a patent according to me. But so let's not zoom on the patent as such but zoom on the bigger discussion, which needs to happen, is to have a, and I think a pandemic treaty like Michelle is putting forward is probably a way to go, you know, and, but in agreement with the industry. So I was very happy, but I can tell you it was a big effort to have industry in Act A being published, not because of the industry, because they absolutely wanted to step up to the game, but the other partners, oh, the industry, that's something uh, difficult, you know. Let's be honest, I haven't seen any government produce a vaccine. Yeah, and, I agree. And, and I agree. And, and I also think that the, the solution comes, as you say, from public private partnership and from licensing. 
uh, people are, are probably a bit naive about the patent questions and, and they're probably mixing up the different and uh, don't see the difference between patenting uh, and protecting with IP and, and giving licenses. Yeah, exactly. And the best comparison I read last week on LinkedIn, uh, for, as a Belgian, you know, we, we are gourmand. We, we like three-star restaurants. It's not because the three-star chef publishes his recipe that somebody else will be able to make that same dish, you know. Um, I wouldn't be <laughs> capable of doing it. No, but I mean, that's maybe too simple a comparison, but I think we need to, to get the, the debate to a higher level. And luckily, luckily Ngozi, as she was chair of Gavi um, at the WTO, is taking a more, um, you know, I mean, she's not in an easy job, but she's not in a black and she's not taking a black and white position. So she's prepared to discuss, actually. And I think that's where we need to go. So we have another question by Reinilde Vögelers. Perhaps, uh, Luc, you know Reinilde, who is a leading figure in uh, the economics of innovation, not only in Belgium, but, but internationally. So Reinilde, please, you can ask your question. Yeah, I think I'm uh, unmuted. Uh, so uh, first of all, I, I'd like to express my full respect for organizations like CEPI and COVAX and, and, and people like you who are behind this. They really make a big difference uh, here. So I'd like to follow up indeed on this question on, on, um, on patents and, and conditions for making sure that we get access of vaccines to, to the whole world uh, here. So I was wondering to which extent CEPI actually also plays a role in that in the sense that um, when you select uh, projects that you will fund, um, at that stage, uh, will you also take into account any conditions that are attached to that funding in terms of uh, uh, licensing conditions uh, here? So, of course, in the public-private partnership, uh, your, your best bargaining position as from the public side is at the time of these negotiations here. So to which extent is that also part of the CEPI agenda to for those funded projects to also uh, identify what the licensing conditions would be that you could uh, attach to, to getting funding? And, and related to that also, to which extent are you also, when you select these projects, also take into account the production uh, conditions uh, here. So, and particularly production, whether it's possible that these projects would also be able to be produced at a large distributed uh, scale as well. Like for instance, the mRNA technology, we know that that's a way more robust way of producing here. Uh, so is that also something as a condition you could uh, you use when you select projects to fund with CEPI? Thank you, thank you very much for those very good questions because there are indeed two topics that are top, top of the list actually in the negotiations with the companies. And we've learned from the past as I uh, explained at the creation of CEPI, um, those policies were too stringent and actually scared away uh, MNCs because <laughs> For, for the anecdote, I came on board actually in July 2019 uh, with CEPI because Richard Hatchett uh, gave me a call and Peter and Jeremy uh, Farrer. Um, why? Because I had sent them a note to say, my observation is that CEPI is great, but the multinational companies are not at the table. So how can we get them to the table? Because my experience as president of GSK Vaccines was that they scared us away because of the IP um, um, policies that they had put in place, which basically meant that you had to pay royalties to CEPI. And all. So it was almost a, a financing, uh, uh, which if you compare to BARDA, you know, in the US doing deals with BARDA was no strings attached, you know. There they just help through innovation. If you look at Operation Warp Speed, IP was never a discussion. It was about giving, you know, helping them, even ordering the machinery to get to fast production, all of that. So. The combination of your two questions is one, yes, we use this in the selection process of, of uh, the developers with whom we talk, but we want to do this in dialogue. So not in a forcing modus anymore, but making sure that they can retain. During the pandemic, all the deals that we've signed of the 10 vaccines that are shared are with no license, ob also no IP obligations. So the IP stays with the developer, with the company. But on the manufacturing piece, uh, I shared what we uh, initially signed the deals with a first right of refusal, but also we, um, we call it matchmaking. <clears throat> we ensured that in the contracting, we made sure that there was geographical spread of the production. So for instance, Novavax was only producing initially in the US with Emergent. And we, we said, you can only, we will only sign a contract for doses if you also have a capacity 
in um, in India and in Europe. So then they bought the Czech Republic facility, which we brokered basically for them. So they bought it from Serum Institute India and they produce on, on European soil and they produce uh, Novavax in Serum Institute of India. But I think your, your very good questions should make us reflect on how to do this even better. And I think that the globe should prepare for that as well in, in um, uh, dialogue with the, um, with the companies. Because my conviction is, and it was actually from the very beginning, SEPI is not a buying power, a region is. And therefore my belief is, and that's why in the strategic connect pillar, um, I stressed a lot to, to SEPI that they need to work with the regions because the regions can mobilize a company because they are a future and current market, not only for those pandemic vaccines, but for, for any medicine or vaccine and therefore have a, are a good party at the table. SEPI can only be a catalyzing factor. So, um, and with the regional effort that you now see with African Union, the US of course, um, and Europe now with the creation of HERA, that's where SEPI needs to play the catalyzing factor, but making sure that the right deal terms are put in with the companies through the regions, working with the regions. That is very powerful, I think. But I'm interested in your view, uh, Renil. <laughs> but that's, uh, we can, we yeah. can dis discuss offline, but that, that's where I think we need to go. Yeah. Use this regional power now with the companies in dialogue to get to pre-agreements on license, uh, as Philippe said, you know, it's not just about the patent. Yeah, very much in line with, with your answer. I, I would say actually, so to, to move more from an ad hoc uh, to a more structural way in which you deal with these licensing constraints as SEPI, I think you need to have also the position there to say that you, you, you will be really de-risking a lot. And that means being able to put in way more money in these projects. Absolutely. For those that bargaining power, you should then also be very clear that you get licensing conditions that you can impose on them. Absolutely. But that requires more money. <laughs> for certain. Yes. Yep. Thanks a lot. Uh, Michelle, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So you you know Zoom quite well, actually. Yeah? <laughs> Matthias, you can ask your question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Thanks a lot, Luc. Uh, it was really uh, a great talk, very, very uh, informative. Uh, I, I like this idea that uncertainty incentivizes collaboration and that scarcity is the enemy of equity. And uh, I guess, uh, and you're right, that somehow the first enemy of equity is uh, politics. Fortunately, it's uh, uh, democracy. <laughs> Reads nationalism because uh, non-citizens don't vote, huh? so which is not to say that uh, dictatorship is better. We agree on that, but uh, it is a big, uh, indeed, a, a big problem. And there, I, I do agree that uh, moving to uh, regional uh, or continental uh, decision makers is a is a is a good idea. Um, the uh, I had. Uh, I thought it was interesting that you said that uh, only Pfizer produces properly. Uh, and uh, it, it, it is a bit uh, of, a, uh, of a problem. I think that uh, when people say that, okay, there were top four uh, pharma companies in vaccines, so Pfizer, GSK, Sanofi, and Merck, until now only Pfizer managed to do it, uh, well, with the help, of course, of BioNTech. Uh, and uh, now, uh, first of all, I think it might be, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear your views about, uh, was it just bad luck of the others, or uh, there is something a bit more structural about uh, where the innovation comes from? Um, this being said, indeed, and we see that in particular with AstraZeneca uh, being a, uh, not being a big vaccine producer is a problem for the production stage. Now, is that the problem also for j, &J? That doesn't seem to be that great either. Uh, I, I would have a question on that. And then I think in terms of indeed the, the working of the, the whole ecosystem in favor of societal goals, should we try and uh, 
kind of a look, for example, at what the Biden administration uh, imposed, I guess, in a sense, on Merck to, to work together with uh, some vaccine producer through the Defense Production Act as one way of the future. Uh, I must say also, and I fully agree that we need to bring all stakeholders together and all that. Uh, this being said, there is also the issue at some point of you know what the price will be of these things. And I must say, I was negatively struck by uh, this uh, comment by the CFO of Pfizer to say that, okay, our current dose is $10, but the normal price should be 175. Now in the US, they are maybe too, uh, too much used in setting the price unilaterally. And we know that they, there is a problem, but with Michelle, we had this uh, little piece in, uh, in uh, Nature Medicine with Alain Fischer about uh, having some kind of, okay, reasonable profit uh, target, uh, possibly through benefit corporation status and the like. Should, to what extent is this connected, by the way, to GSK's uh, biopreparedness type thing? Uh, is that I'm not saying that we should impose uh, necessarily uh, these uh, kind of reasonable profit uh, targets on the whole business of, uh, of pharma companies, but maybe for some issues, we were talking about rare diseases, but now we are talking about pandemics. Is that one way to go? Uh, of course, without, without killing the uh, production scale, which of course is what we need. Uh, and indeed, it is not about patterns only and all these kinds of things. But uh, I thought I would be interested to to hear your views on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, uh, of course, there's there's a lot you said, uh, but I'll try to 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 answer uh, specifically. Um, the first thing where you said about the politicians, so where your your first comment uh, or reaction on what I had said. One thing we should not forget is community engagement. We don't talk on enough about that, but I think science and innovation need to be at the service of the communities. And we struggle now with, with a lack of community engagement that is done during peacetime, because um, how many times do we talk about vaccines? You know, vaccines have only, now everybody knows vaccines and knows vaccine production and knows viruses and all of that. That's only since 2020. You know, analysts, even analysts, I met with analysts every quarter at GSK, most, most were not interested because you only had four companies, basically, GSK, Pfizer, Merck, and Sanofi, making, uh, developing and producing vaccines, selling them at pretty cheap prices, actually, and they were not very interested. Pharma is way more lucrative, they thought, because it's not true. But anyway, so that, I think, we need to make sure scientists are, are, are now on the screen every day, which is great, you know, but we need to continue that effort also outside of pandemics to create confidence and trust so that then when whatever happens that <clears throat> there is that community, uh, proactive community engagement uh, done. Just, just to comment on that. So it's not just politicians, it's also the, the community preparation. On the Merck GSK Sanofi piece, ha. Huh, I have my personal views of that, of course, but uh, I think these are strategic choices they've made um, based upon the past. Because many times when you step up into a pandemic, you pay for it uh, ages afterwards. You never make money in a pandemic, basically. I mean, we never had a pandemic like we are experiencing now. So it was judgment of the past used to inform the strategy of a future. And they will, they will obviously review their strategy. But that's, I think, the reason why they were slow at stepping up. Whereas if you look at AstraZeneca, no experience in vaccines, they stuck out their neck too far, you know? Pascal Sarrio was first a hero, and then he was bashed all, all the time, you know? <clears throat> but ultimately, honestly, okay, it was bad communication, but it was primarily bad ex inexperience with vaccines. I can tell you, I'm very close to, to one of the executives. I told him, you'll get gray hairs the minute you start pushing the button of production of vaccines because that's when all the stuff will happen. Um, and that's what, what we're experiencing. So why I then made that comment of Pfizer-BioNTech, that's the ideal combination. But you know why Pfizer can do this? They only have one vaccine, a pneumococcal vaccine, and that's it. GSK, Sanofi, Merck, they produce 40 or 30 vaccines every day, you know, in billions of doses for the world. And there are not that many who do that. I'm not saying that they were right, absolutely not. Because that brings me to the next piece of your question, which is, 
absolutely, I think that regions in the very beginning of this pandemic should have put, like Trump has done actually, put together in the White House, the CEOs of the big companies says, hey guys, how are we going to solve this? I'll give you the check and all the support you need, you know, and just go after it. And that's what they've done. I think we can learn from that effort, you know. If I would have been Ursula, that's what I would have done the very first day of the pandemic. Put those CEOs in my room and say, hey guys, let's be serious now. How are we going to deal with this? But with the money, you know, and everything that is needed. And it's not about the money. It's about covering the risk, sharing the risk. It's about, and that then brings you to how you look towards the future for this. I mean, there are systems uh, that people way cleverer than I can, can, can construct, which are, for instance, you know, a priority license. You know, FDA uses this in rare disease. Why can't we do that for pandemics, you know? You share your technology, and we can use it, and therefore you get a priority license for one of your drugs, you know, to get them one year faster to the market. Or it exists in Europe already with, if you do studies in children, you get a patent prolongation for, for X number of years. These kind of mechanisms that incentivize industry to share their technologies is a positive approach rather than compulsory licensing and, and, and uh, arm wrestling. I, I think we, we need those companies. We need small biotech, we need biotech, we need um, universities, we need innovation centers. But when a pandemic hits, you need the big boys, you know, to scale up and to do what needs to be done to develop fast and to produce in, in mass quantities, not only during wartime, but also during peacetime. So it's that challenge that is out there, uh, according to me. So it's risk sharing and tax incentives, uh, all these kind of things. Uh, I mean, let's not forget, <laughs> let's be a bit uh, Belgian. I mean, Belgian, Belgium had the foresight 20, 30 years ago to invest in biotech. That's why biotech is flourishing. And it's through creating the right ecosystem. It will be challenging now, you know, to continue that ecosystem because now suddenly everybody starts to realize, well, oh, maybe I should have had this. But here I believe the small country approach is the right one. So let's be a bit Belgian to answer your, your last question on what, what could have been done. <laughs> Again, it's easy to say from an armchair, so I'm not a politician. But with all the Belgian capacity on Belgian ground, we should have had all the vaccines we needed instantly because we are not a threat. Belgium is not a threat to the globe to foresee vaccines for the whole world. That, that is what you need to put into agreement so that that country is incentivized as well to continue to provide the right ecosystem so that it can thrive. But it's easy to say, as I said, from an armchair uh, after the fact. But we need to think about these things going forward, I think. Over. Luc, I would, I would like to continue on this question and go back since you have been so much involved in Ebola. And, you know, there are two Ebola vaccines by two companies which are not, well, one is not in the race, it's Merck. The other is j, &J which is in the race, but with some problem on the same adenoviral technology. So, we could have anticipated that this would give a competitive advantage because they already went through all the process of producing, manufacturing, regulatory approval. So is it really the question of, you know, massive production of billion doses, which prevent them to be in the lead? It's, it's a bit of a combination. So first of all, because I didn't answer the question from uh, uh, Matthias, which is j, j is a very good R&D company for vaccines, but doesn't have the infrastructure. They, yeah. they basically don't, they have laden and that's it, you know, and that's something they bought from uh, from uh, uh, from the Swiss company, you know, so they're not, they don't have the infrastructure. So therefore, they had the issue uh, in, uh, in, um, in the US in emergent, you know, where the, there was a contamination with the AstraZeneca vaccine, you know, and now they have to take charge of that. And in the meantime, you have the DPA, you know, so they, it's, it's also the government, the US government doesn't make it easy for, for j, j because their vaccine goes to emergent, has to come to Europe for fill finish. And, and if those transports are not allowed, you know, you, you get into trouble. Secondly, they need to tech transfer to BioE in India. With the geopolitics now, it becomes a question, you know, what will the Indian, what, would, what will Moody do? You know, we've mobilized with SEPI and with WHO, the whole world. But ethically speaking, you cannot say to Modi, you know, uh, well, we'll take all the vaccines that were <laughs> foreseen for COVAX and leave you a, 
even if we can all explain why and what should have been done. But so, so J&J is not a massive vaccine producer. The, the good news is from a scientific development, yes, they were fast because they had, I still remember talking to Johan and, and Paul Stoffels, you know, when the Ebola vaccine was used in DRC, this creates a massive safety database that they have been able to activate instantly for the, and they have fantastic good yields, uh, production yields as well. But the infrastructure is a tech transfer infrastructure. And as I said earlier, if you wanna do it fast, you will run into trouble because your process stability, which you tech transfer is, a, is another challenge than doing it in Leiden where you manage everything. So it's, it's a combination of, of, of all of that, uh, Michelle. Thank you. Any other <clears throat> question, Ilde or Caroline yeah. or? Yes, I have a question. Well, there are two questions from uh, the audience, so I will keep it. Um, I will keep it brief. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk uh, on the pre-agreements that need to be included in public-private partnership uh, project agreements. I would like to draw the audience attention. If you would like to do some research on this, there is a PhD position uh, with I3H on this uh, research. So please visit our website for this. But on this, I would want to ask, and it's building actually further on the discussion with, with Matthias um, on access, of course, especially, um, and also stressed by you, technology transfer, but especially, and then with regard to the, uh, transfer of know-how on, on vaccine production. Would it be an idea that um, from a European, on the regional side, and European um, Commission funds much more postdoc positions who then could be trained on or in the industry to become really the next healthcare professionals in both laboratories, but much more interdisciplinary, being able to be sent out and engage the community, uh, train uh, local facilities. Would that be an idea that there is much more uh, European, because we are here in Europe, uh, European money invested to train academics, high level academics, of course, in industry? I think the truth is always in the middle in the sense that you absolutely need the accountability and the ownership of the originating company uh, in during the tech transfer because it's only a few people actually that, that know that and it's not something you can teach at university. You have to have done it. And then, you, and Philippe knows this better than I do, Philippe Fontaine, but you, you have a, a, a very small group that, that can do that. Secondly, quality in vaccine production, specifically for vaccines, 70% of your time is spent on quality assessments. And that's the biggest challenge. So when we did that GSK tech transfers to countries, even like Japan with Daiichi Sankyo, for two, three years, you have your own quality people on the ground in the factory to ensure that no vaccine comes out of that factory that doesn't respond to the quality requirements. People tend to forget that, but 70% is spent on quality assessments. But the, what you say, uh, what is good in your proposal is absolutely ensuring that we have trained forces and that we do way more uh, working with the companies um, that we kind of almost, that was my dream when I was still at GSK, have a, a, a tool book, a toolbox actually for tech transferring so that you can do it. Because I started actually with the malaria vaccine with the intent to tech transfer it to, to Africa. So I had started with that already in 2017. I am very happy now with the African Union. One thing maybe, and I don't wanna be teaching grandma how to suck eggs, but it's important that the attitude for, of the developing countries, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, or definitely of the African Union, they don't wanna be the recipes. They don't wanna be the receiving end. They wanna be owning that factory. But of course the bridge, that's where Europe can play a very important role because you need a bridge of number of doses. So you could say initial capacity uh, produced in Europe, X percentage needs to go during that building up of capacity in Africa period to Africa when there's, a, when there's an outbreak as well. Secondly, bring people from Africa in our universities or with their university to train them, bring them in the companies to train them so that they can go back to their countries to own it. The experience of DRC was great, you know, they refused to send blood samples to outside of DRC. They said, we teach us how to do it and we'll do it ourselves. And we've introduced a full LASA epidemiology project in a few countries now in Africa, where we 
just transfer the capability and the capacity with local universities. So this bridging function is a very important one. A bit, um, I don't know if you read the article, but in the FT this morning about Europe, they will make a big announcement, I think, uh, uh, later this week on Friday, on the 21st, on how they want to help Africa. But again, US wants to do it. Europe wants to do it. That's all great energy. Important for SEP is to try to, to, to catalyze that we don't duplicate, but actually uh, leverage each other's efforts in all of that so that we can, uh, but geopolitics will cross uh, <laughs> that road again, I guess. But it's good to see the energy. So, so yeah, we need to invest uh, both here and there in, in both sides. No, so thank you very much. And I think your comment is also important in terms of overcoming vaccine hesitancy in those countries, which is another challenge. So perhaps we will take a very last question by Rostant Ada. And the question is about the role of China and Russia in the process of vaccine development and production. And the, and the more specific question is whether they are somehow implicated in CEPI. So good question, of course, because it's on top of everybody's mind when they first came with their Sputnik vaccine, uh, the Russians very quickly, actually. Um, well, CEPI has absolutely done the necessary assessments and worked with the regulators as well to do the necessary assessments, because imagine if it can be filed and can be produced at scale, because we each time took the same criteria, speed, scale and access, because we wanted to achieve the two billion target. Uh, by the end of 2021, with all the pressure now, with um, everything we've explained why we don't have yet the 2 billion doses, of course, if we could lay our hands on one or two other vaccines, that would be great. So <clears throat> the Russian vaccine has not passed that test, that regulatory test, because not enough data and also manufacturing issues where they did not purify well enough their uh, vaccine production and therefore uh, will have likely uh, quality issues. So that has not gone through. The Chinese vaccine you saw probably last week, WHO has given a pre-qualification to Sinopharm. And so we are in negotiations with Sinopharm now. Um, but again, geopolitically, you know, I cannot imagine, but maybe I'm completely wrong, that Europe would distribute the Chinese vaccine. I, I don't see it happening tomorrow, you know. Of course, they don't need it now, they have enough. But imagine in the beginning of the crisis, I think that that would be, uh, but that's geopolitics. So I'm not a politician <laughs> or not well versed enough to judge about that. What I can say is that <clears throat> the future of vaccines in China is completely different than what it was in the past. I've experienced, I had very bad experiences in China with vaccine production and all of that. And Philippe, I'm sure you have as well. But if you go to the, the trade free zone in uh, Shanghai, you know, you go into uh, Wuxi Pharma, you know, these guys produce monoclonals and and now we'll produce vaccines in Ireland for, for Merck, you know, Gardasil from 2022 onwards, you know, and these guys know absolutely how to do it. So the copy paste attitude is by far gone. They are, they are innovating and they are putting the money, you know, and they were very fast on uh, putting, uh, but they need to create societal trust, of course, and that's the next phase probably for China. But, but as you know, geopolitics will play a role as well. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Luke. So we are just on time, it's just uh, 2 p.m. So I just want to thank you very much again, not only for your talk, but also for your frank and very informative answers to the several questions. I also want to, to thank Hilde, Caroline and Anya for making this webinar possible. And also all our attendees, and I'm sure that we will have you know, further opportunities to discuss these important questions in the near future. So thank you very much to everyone and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Bye.